Uh, she was a French author, journalist, uh, feminist and European politician from the area of uh, Alsace that comes from the German river Ill. I uh, don't know if you know about the Illies or the Illuminati in this case, very interesting point. The biggest city in this area region is Strasbourg, we, we'll return to this later. Louise Weiss was a suffragette and founded the association La Femme Nouvelle, this is the new woman. I don't know if you guys have heard some of the presentations by Jordan Maxwell, he talks about the new man. Well, this lady brought in the idea of the new woman. Really interesting stuff. Um, in 1979, she was elected to the European Party, uh, etc. You might get the, the, the idea here. So just interesting side note. So look at the European Parliament again, this same building, Louis Weiss building uh, in Strasbourg. There it is. Tower of Babel, the, the, the famous painting by Peter Bruegel, the elder Flemish artist. And let's combine them. This is the Tower of Babel. I don't know, you might have seen this before. Um, what are these guys up to here? What is the implication here? Uh, they even left it kind of unfinished, as it were, just as this depiction of Peter Bruegel in the Tower of Babel uh, as, as a work in process. The great work, in that sense, is, is in process. Um, and if you think I'm just out and, and finding things that aren't there, this is a poster from the European U uh, Union themselves, uh, which incorporates the whole idea. Europe, many tongues, one voice. That's the whole idea of Tower of Babel, they're splitting up the languages and all that stuff too. Uh, so what's going on here? It's this biblical prophecy being fulfilled. Uh, if you read from Professor Arthur Noble, he writes on Ian Paisley's actually uh, website, European Institute of Protestant Studies. Roman Catholic imagery is endemic in Europe and has been enthusiastically embraced by the European Parliament. It has starting similarities to the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 17, which theologians from Wycliffe to Spurgeon have consistently identified as representing papal Rome. The, uh, they depict a latter-day political union which in its final form will consist of ten nations or groups of nations dominated by a power which sits upon seven hills, Rome. Um, this vision is of a great whore riding the beast with seven heads and ten horns and bearing the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother, Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. Uh, today this prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Europe is Vatican inspired and Vatican controlled. This is what I call uh, in that sense the Armageddon program. It's part of the Apocalypse program. Um, I personally don't believe that it's prophecy being fulfilled. I think it's the the blueprint, if you will, of the Bible that is being um, implemented here. They're using these symbols and powerful messages to some way even to bring these things in. In some cases there might even be people out there who are anticipating this because of the, the consequence, the return of Jesus and all that stuff too. So they're, they're using these potent and powerful symbols to portray this. Uh, Strasbourg, as we mentioned before, the head of the European Parliament, uh, Louis Weiss building, interesting design by the way, similarity. Uh, the seat of the Council of Europe, which is, uh, you know, is here. Eurocorps, the new uh, army that is be being built up as well. Um, Strasbourg overall is very important in Fire in the Minds of Men by James H. Billington. He discusses how uh, the revolutionary movement uh, basically started and, and, and uh, has its roots in Strasbourg actually. And that's why I think they placed these, the, the, the buildings here as well. Um, it was an imperial city important to the Carolingian Empire and was the center of humanist scholarship and early book printing in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, a lot of things to say about Strasbourg overall. At one point the, even the, the spire of the cathedral in Strasbourg was replaced by a Phrygian cap or a tin Phrygian cap was placed on, on top of it. For those who, who know the symbolism of the Phrygian cap. Uh, there it is up there in case you didn't know that. And it, it dovetails with the revolutionary movement, the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, the woman again, look at that, that's the image, the famous image from, uh, who was it now again here? Uh, Lacroix, I think it's painted this, uh, Liberty Leading the People. She's bare-breasted again like the Minoan uh, <coughs> goddess statuette. In her arms she holds a flag and, and a gun, a rifle instead of the two snakes. But very similar, she's wearing the Phrygian cap as well. Look at this socialist uh, symbol here, or communist symbol. The Roman uh, olive branches behind, the five-pointed star of you know, Lucifer in that sense that we talked about before, and the white hand getting ready to clutch the torch of enlightenment, as it were, in that sense. We're talking about the Illuminati here in, in one sense. Although he set up shop in Bavaria, I think that a lot of the ideas that he got stems from, from, from Strasbourg, actually. Uh, so much to say, but we'll, we'll move on for now. The all-seeing Europe. Let's look at some of this stuff. Project Galileo, or, or the uh, Global Navigation Satellite System that is designed to rival or compete with the, G the GPS system. 
you are paying for it. Uh, it costs 3.4 billion euros. Um, the system would store 19 pieces of sensitive passenger information, including email addresses, telephone numbers, and payment details of flight tickets for 13 years. It's a whole system they're building, building out there. Project INDECT, intelligent information system supporting observation, searching, and detecting for security of citizens in urban environment. That's a mouthful for you right there. Um, this is also very similar in terms of uh, Project Galileo. These might well connect at some point as well and, and cross-share information or what have you. It's basically a, a 21st century panopticon that they're building up. A beast surveillance system has been called. Uh, that monitors e everything from web websites to discussion forums to peer-to-peer -peer -peer networks, uh, inclu inclu individual computer systems, uh, in order to detect what they call abnormal behavior, whatever that is, um, and suspicious behavior in that sense, and by analyzing the pitch of people's voices, as well as the way your body moves. You know, you pay for it as well, by the way. Uh, here's uh, European Audiovisual Observatory, they're all saying the Concilium or the Council of the European Union. And these guys are the, the real uh, guys in charge in that sense. Forget about the, the Parliament, the European Parliament, even the European Commission in that sense. Uh, the, the Council of Europe, uh, European Union, they, they're really in charge. Side note, very interesting, they're all seeing Euro. Look at this, this is the Euro, uh, the schematics, the maths, the, the alignment stuff. Turn it on its sides and we can actually inc see incorporated into the design of it, if you will. A, uh, a pyramid with a capstone slightly removed in that sense. If we supplant the image with a true schematic of the, the Great Pyramid, don't know if you can see that properly, but right there where the, where the circle ends right there, is the, the shafts leading from the King's Chamber. Duff is right with the inner, inner circle, as it were, of, of, that, of the Euro. And in, just in case you didn't have enough, Europe and you in 2007. Snapshot of EU achievements. Let's go into a little bit more in detail in terms of the hidden roots then of the European Union, talk about some of the history uh, and historical unification attempts in, in the past. I would put in Alexander the Great here as well. He moved his empire, so to speak, a little bit more towards the east, but anyway, he spearheaded a lot of this stuff as well. Um, the Roman uh, Republic and later the Roman Empire eventually splits up into the Western Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Keep an eye on the double-headed eagle there as well, by the way. Um, and then we have the Merovingian dynasty, the Frankish Empire, uh, later turned into the Carolingian Empire. This is the uh, exp expans expansion then specifically during uh, the Frankish uh, Empire, as it were. Then we have the Holy Roman Empire. This is known as the First Reich. The double-headed eagle is back there. Uh, the First French Empire, or uh, N Napoleon's Empire, the eagle. Austro-Hungarian Empire, or House of Habsburg comes up, the double-headed eagle is there again. Uh, the Second Reich, German Empire. You have National Socialism done. The Third Reich popping up on the scene, Nazi Germany. Then we have the United States of Europe, or the European Union, what I call the New Holy Roman Empire in that sense. And I, I put the inception date to 1923, around that time. We'll look at that more in detail later on. Um, let's see if we can get some audio on this as well, because I'm going to play a quick clip here as well. Uh, this is Jose Manuel Barroso. and just going to the, to the European Commission themselves and see what they think about all this. What, what does, what's, does all this mean? Uh, sorry, let's go back. There we go. Let's see if we can click on this. Sometimes I like to compare the European Union as a creation to the organization of empires. The empires. And uh, because we have the dimension of empires, but there is a great difference. The empires were usually made through force, with a center that was imposing a diktat, a will on the others. And now we have what some authors call the first non-imperial empire. We have, by dimension, 27 countries that freely decided to work together to pool their sovereignties, if you want to use that concept of sovereignty, and work together to add value. I believe it's a great construction, and we should be proud of it. At least we in the Commission are proud. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they're very proud. Uh, sounds lovely in one way at the, at the end there, but at the same time I think that they are you know, creating a kind of a European monoculture in that sense. He's talking about sovereignty here. Uh, this will obviously prove itself in, in history if, if it's true or not, you know, but they're, they're in one way eroding nationalities in that sense. Uh, if that's good or bad, that's, that's up to you obviously, but it's just interesting to hear what they say about it themselves. You know what the European Union is. And so who is, you know, in that sense, Jose Manuel Barroso, 
Uh, he's a former head of actually the Maoist student uh, 